a team of Finnish researchers concluded that the person with a non-binary gender identity was buried in a burial dating from the medieval period. They made this conclusion after DNA analysis. Have you ever wondered what dinosaurs actually look like? It's a difficult question, since we only have their bones at our disposal. However, one specimen found in China provided enough information to create an extremely faithful replica of a dinosaur. About this and not only, see in this video. But before that, press the thumb up under the video. Hi friends, you're on the Kurtop channel. The warrior in the burial turned out to be a non-binary person. An unusual war grave was discovered by archaeologists in the town of Santaka in southern Finland back in 1968. Scientists were surprised that the deceased, next to whom lay a weapon typical of military graves of that time, had women's jewelry. Only now, thanks to the development of genetic technologies, it was possible to shed a little light on who the warrior was buried in Santaka. Based on the analysis of the DNA extracted from a fragment of the warrior's bone, it was determined that he had an additional X chromosome. This may indicate that the deceased had Klinefelter's syndrome, a rare male genetic disorder characterized by low testosterone levels, lack of hairline, gynecomastia, male breast enlargement, and learning difficulties. This burial is distinguished by an unusual and pronounced combination of male and female symbolism, which may indicate that the deceased was not associated with any of the traditional genders, but with something else. Exactly how the Swantek warrior was perceived by society remains unknown but a more thorough study of the burial could add a little clarity to this mystery. The warrior was buried in women's clothing next to brooches and bird feathers, which is typical for a female burial rite. However, a toothless sword was also placed in the burial. After some time, a bronze sword with a carved handle was also placed in the grave. Primitive people in one of the production conveyor from 1979 to 1999, archaeologists worked in the Castel de Guido region of Italy near Rome. They found the remains of elephants in a deep ravine. Apparently, the animals came to the reservoir located here and sometimes died. Ancient people were able to benefit from this. Ivory tools were found near the ravine. In addition to ready-made chisels and axe handles, rough-cut bones were found, which with proper scale quickly turned into useful utensils. These were kind of blinks. This that scientists managed to find the first primitive conveyor belt of the Stone Age. The Castle de Guido region was inhabited by straight-tailed forest elephants, which were hunted by local residents. They were 4 meters tall and ate leaves from tall trees, but despite the abundance of food, these animals depended on fresh water. Therefore, they had to settle near water bodies, along the banks of which people often lived, their main enemies. People too could not exist without water, and the proximity of animals and tribes gave rise to their coexistence according to the prey hunter type. And if some tribes had to organize whole military campaigns in order to get the skin and bones of an elephant, then for the people living by the reservoir in Castle de Ghetto, this need disappeared. Animals periodically died at the watering hole, and ancient people used their remains. The blanks were created by simply breaking bones. When the need aroused to obtain a tool, the blanks are processed and polished. The researchers know that Neanderthals were resourceful and cognitively intelligent as they created various rather complex objects from stones and bones. Therefore, those who consider the world Neanderthal offensive and rude underestimate their ancestors. They had a well-developed speech, they swam well, cultivated tools and created the first conveyor. Ancient Cuteness this dinosaur is called Psittacosaurus mongoliensis. It was widespread in East Asia during the early and middle Cretaceous. He was small, about the size of a turkey, and ate nuts, seeds, and plants. The specimen on which this copy is based was found in China in 2014 with preserved skin, feathers, and soft tissue. This allowed artist Bob Nichols and a group of paleontologists to study the dinosaur and understand exactly how it looked and lived. The result of the work was published in the journal current biology. Scientists scanned the sample with laser equipment to understand what the skin pigmentation was in the dinosaur and found that Psittacosaurus had a protective coloration that is still common in animals today. The dinosaur had a dark black and a lighter belly. Scientists have identified the skin pigmentation of a dinosaur for the first time, which means that a 3D copy of Psittacosaurus is the most accurate portrait of a dinosaur, at least for now. What is an artifact and how to identify it? 
An artifact is a cultural phenomenon that is, it has an artificial, not natural origin, and it is unique. An artifact can be an object created by a person and carrying some semantic information that is of culture and aesthetic value. In this case, it actually coincides with the work of art, but there are nuances. The artifact is valuable not only for its spiritual content, but also for its physical embodiment. It is always a subject, and I repeat, it should be important for culture. That is, for example, La Giaconza by Leonardo da Vinci. On the one hand, a work of art, but on the other hand, it is an artifact. In the first sense, the picture has artistic imagery and aesthetic value. In the second, it has value as a material object. But of course, since both hypotheses are merged in the work hiding the La Giaconda behind bulletproof glass in a special safe with a constant temperature, the lover protects this masterpiece of Leonardo both as a work of art and as an artifact. Why do people crowd in front of this glass behind which Mona Lisa smiles mysteriously? Seriously. Have they come to admire the work of art? They came to gaze at the artifact. Communication with the work is impossible in a crowd, in the noise and clicking of cameras. It requires silence and concentration. The artifact is intended to evoke surprise, interest, curiosity. But a piece of music cannot be called an artifact. Let's say the so-called Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven is a work of art and it lives at the moment of its execution. However, the musical notation of this sonata, made by the composer himself, Itself, will be an artifact because in this case it is important that this object embodiment of the work is a unique original, the first recording. The work itself is not tied to this thing, in the sense that it exists when it sounds, while the notes can be rewritten by anyone or printed in mass circulation. So the musical notation printed in a typography for musicians is not an artifact, unlike the notes written by the composer's hand. Beethoven's manuscript is valuable because it belonged to him, it captures the features of Beethoven's recording of music. This is its cultural significance, which turns the sheet of paper with notes into an artifact. I think you understand what an artifact is. This is a valuable cultural object that carries a certain meaning, one way or another broadens the horizons of people, and reaches our knowledge of culture and often also has symbolic meaning. Each artifact has its own personality. Why the ancient chronicles were not preserved why are there no ancient chronicles? Why are all the chronicles that are in the modern official historical science are not the same ancient primary sources, but lists from more ancient manuscripts? But these ancient manuscripts themselves have been lost? Why are some of the leaves in some manuscripts replaced at a later time? There are the most frequently asked questions by supporters of falsification of history. I'm not going to prove that there was no falsification of ancient sources, but I want to give the described phenomena a simple and logical explanation. Knowledge has been valued at all times. This explains the huge archives libraries in many world capitals. But many libraries were completely destroyed in flames, like the one of Alexandria. Some libraries, such as the notorious library of Ivan the Terrible, were simply lost. But why even the surviving libraries, instead of the ancient primary sources themselves, their later copies are often presented? Here I will give a simple analogy. It is in 200-300 years that our clothes that have survived until that time will become of a certain value for historians of the future as an example of our everyday life. And for us, our clothes are a completely utilitarian attribute. When clothes become unusable, they are either repaired or disposed of, replaced with new ones. At the same time, old clothes cease to have any value for us. Similarly, having made repairs, preserving the functional content of the interior, we do not care at all about the preservation of the elements of the old interior. They lose their value for us the very moment they are replaced by new ones, even if they are generally the same but new ones. Likewise with historical literature. It is difficult to imagine that the same tale of bygone years was not used for centuries, but was lying and gathering dust somewhere on the shelf of some monastery. At the very least, it has been repeatedly reread and rewritten. Her lists are presented in the Laurentian Chronicle, the Ipetiv Chronicle, the Redzeville Chronicle. But these lists have come down to us, including in the form of even later lists. How were books copied in those days? Many only, frankly, not to clean hands in dirty, cramped cells by candlelight. Inevitably, scuffs and greases, wax and ink stains, tears of pages appeared on the original. What to do with worn out or damaged original sheets? That's right, some were to restore an unreadable fragment, write a new one right on top of the old text and maybe even replace the old sheets with new ones, and the original was disposed of. It should also be noted that the more ancient the original was, the more primitive it was created and the faster it fell into disrepair. The 
Gandhi was not the book itself as a physical carrier of knowledge, but exclusively the knowledge contained in it. Therefore, while rewriting books, people try to preserve knowledge itself and not at all its carrier. Often scholars find that some of the great paintings of great artists are painted on top of other, older paintings, but no less famous masters today. This now the previous picture, being suddenly discovered today in its pure form, would have a value with many zeros in dollars. And then for the artist, the previous picture was only a ready-made material on which he created what in his opinion was of value. Can we blame the ancient chronicles for copying books but not caring about the original? They, from their point of view, were good, preserved knowledge for future generations and not craft from time to time rubbed sheets of paper, birch bark or parchment. Subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. Every kind comment I will definitely answer. Thanks for your views. Bye everyone!